thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful Christmas music. It really sets the tone for this Christmas season, and it's hard to believe that we're here in our third Sunday of Advent. Truly amazing. Well, I'd like to start off with a quick thank you to all of the volunteers and those that led the charge, especially for the different events of Sunday. Last Sunday, we had our Christmas dinner and afternoon in Bethlehem, and we just are so grateful. Could we put our hands together and thank all the people that were involved in that? And last night as well, we had, uh, or I guess that was um, Friday night, right? Was it Friday night? My days are starting to blur a lock-in. <laughs> so, and we're, we're grateful. Thank you to the Heckamans for leading the charge on that and for the, all the people that were involved in that. I also like to um, say that we have a couple of things coming up I want you to be aware of. We have Kids Club today at five o'clock. So those that are in kindergarten through sixth grade can be a part of that. And then Pastor Dave's small group um, is also going to be meeting this evening at five o'clock. And so we'd like for you to be a part of those experiences and look at your bulletins closely. I believe that the, the stockings are due today. You can put those in the gathering place. If you didn't bring that in today, then you can bring it in by tonight. The church will be open at about a quarter till. So uh, we also want to start off our service with the Advent reading. If we could have the Advent readers come forward at this point, we'll get that going. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness, let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and, supp and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, will, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Philippians four, chapter 4, 4 through 7. Jesus is near, despite the busyness, the pressure, and the assault of our senses that so often passes for Christmas. We have the promise of scripture that Jesus is near. When the shopping drains us physically, and the spending drains us financially. When we forget which party we're supposed to attend on which day. When we think we can't stand to hear rocking around the Christmas tree one more time. Then we will remember to rejoice and again rejoice. And we light a candle to help us remember that Jesus is near. The peace of God will keep us in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you.
sense your presence and we do love you we love you this morning and always and thank you so much for your supernatural entrance onto planet earth some 2,000 years ago thank you for that event now may we truly engage our hearts and minds as we worship in this next one joy as this next song will say let's worship him
good morning. I appreciate that Kennedy and Addison pulled the microphone down for me, so that was awesome. <laughs> One, uh, just one quick announcement. I would, uh, today is our last Sunday for the love offering. And if you're in, we've got a little detail in the bulletin, but the love offering is for our church staff, our pastors, uh, all of our church staff that work tire, tirelessly through the, uh, through the year. And this is just our opportunity to uh, give a little thanks back to them. And if you want to, you can you can make any type of donation in this envelope. Put it in the uh, in the offering plate, or there's also a basket in the back of the Family Life Center. So, thank you for your generosity.
we may come here today to give you praise, to worship you, to give back to you a portion of that you have given us. We ask that you be with us this day, guide us and strengthen us through your word. Amen. You may be seated. Wow. So how's it going? Good. Yeah, good. Okay. How many people think they're smart? Raise your hand. I want to see everybody's hands. Come on. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Up really high. Everyone's smart, right? I mean, some people are smarter at other things than some, right? But everybody's smart. I want to see everybody's hand up, right? Yes. Okay. So we're going to um, talk about a very smart king. And I like your guys' little crowns. That's really good. That's that pertains to this, okay? So I have a little thing here. All right. Well, first, let's talk about this king for a little bit. Does anybody know what king I'm talking about? Solomon. Yes. He, other than Jesus, he, uh-uh, not yet. He was the wisest man ever, besides Jesus. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. And he could have asked for anything. He could have been the richest person in the world. And he asked for what? Wisdom. wisdom. No, he didn't ask for riches. He asked for wisdom so that he could guide God's people, right? All right. So we're going to do a little thing here. All right. I have some very fake gold coins, okay? All right. So we're just going to get a few handfuls. Here you go. No, they're not chocolate. That's what Mike asked. Yeah. I think Mike was ready to tear into them yesterday. I actually borrowed these from my work. We use these for our chili cook-off. All right. Does everybody have some? Oh, my goodness. No. Here you go. I can give them some. Okay. Hey, buddy. Come here. Want some coins? And I forgot your name. What's your name? Daniel. I Daniel. You're Daniel. Here, you can have one of them. Here you go. No, no. Does everybody have some? No, I have nine. You have nine? Okay, let's not count. Okay, let's not count because we don't have even amounts. Oh, there you go. You can have the rest. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to put, how about we put our, our coins in this bowl here? And uh, when you put them in, just say, like, um, what you're really smart at. So... Can I have one of them? Okay, so I'm really, I'm really, okay, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So I am really smart with numbers, okay? So just put those, like, just say what you're smart. If you're good in, if you're a good reader, okay? You can put multiples in at a time. Pastor Dave needs to preach. Here, let's just keep going. What else are you smart at? Writing? Anybody good at writing? And reading. I'm good at writing. Writing, I love that. Okay, writing and reading. I'm hearing a lot of that. Any good science people? Oh, yeah, you could tutor me. Okay, I'm smart at gardening. At gardening? Oh, wow. Okay, all right. Did everybody put their what are you smart at? Okay, how about praying? Anybody smart at praying? Yes, oh, yes, very good. Okay, so do we have all the coins? All right. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, keep them in there. Oops. Here we go. All right. You got to put them all in or, or my little trick won't work. Does everybody have all their coins? There you go. Okay. So now let's try to put, what, it, what is this? What it, what I, found, I found one. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. So what does this represent? Wait, wait, can I get it in here? No. Oh. Oh. Wow. So when I put all of this stuff in, then there's no room for this. That's bad, right? All right, let's try this again. All right? We're just going to put them all right here. Okay, now we're going to put, what, is, what does this represent? God. God. Let's put him in first, okay? Now put all your smarts in there. I love doing this stuff. Yes. You like kissing? Oh, you're good at kissing your mommy. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. Okay, do. Oh, there. Oh, you're sitting on somebody. Oh, there you go. 
Okay. All right. Yeah, we got to make this quick. Okay. Now, what happened? Look. What happened? It all. Cross fits in there. The cross fits in. So. I want to it. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Don't dump them. Okay. All right. So, what does that mean? What does that mean? Jesus died on the cross. He did. And if we put him first, we are being very wise, aren't we? Yes. Yes. Okay. So can you all bow your head and say, we'll say a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for making us smart. And we pray that you will always be first with us. Amen. Okay. Well, at this time, uh, we have uh, a great celebration, a holy baptism of Joseph Bainbridge. So if Joseph and his uh, family would like to come up and stand with us here, um, how about if you stand right there by the table over there? And uh, Laura, you want to say a few words here? Yeah, we were blessed to get an opportunity, those of us who were on the youth retreat, going back a couple, several weeks back, and Joseph was part of that group, as well as the Bainbridge parents and Luke, and we were just really blessed to be a part of that. But it was at that, um, it was at that retreat that Joseph came to a point of decision that he really did want to be baptized and make that a public profession of faith. And we're so glad, and we all want to get behind him and his decision, and we all want to support that. Um, there are others that also made decisions, but they will go through the more traditional um, confirmation experience that we'll offer here before too long. So I just want to bless you, Joseph. We love you. I speak on behalf of all of the youth workers and the parents that are in this congregation that love you, that have been praying for you, that want to get behind you and support you. We support your decision to follow Christ, and we want to help you do that. Mm -hmm. And the choir, too. <laughs> That's right. He's in the choir. All right. So. Well, Joseph, do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life? Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? I do you promise according to the grace given you to keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life as a faithful member of Christ's holy church? I do. And do you commit to be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? I do. All right. Well, I want to thank you as a family for uh, nurturing your children in the Christian faith and bringing them to church. And so uh, uh, at this time, let me uh, pour the, bap the waters of baptism and have a prayer and, and uh, then Joseph will ask you to kneel there so and Lord as we come to you now we give you thanks for Joseph and his commitment we especially thank you for your grace which comes long before our faith commitment and your grace uh, leading us uh, to, to faith in Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And so we give you thanks and be with Joseph now in his baptism. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And Joseph, if you'll kneel there. Uh, and Joseph, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And if you'd like to, anybody like to gather around here, we'll lay hands on him and pray for the Holy Spirit to fill him. Joseph, the Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, Joseph, see, I... I grew up in a church that believed in immersion. <laughs> we wanted to make sure you experienced your baptism. Okay, so, and if you'd like to, if, ever, if all of you would like to stand with us here and we're going to affirm our faith together. Do we have the Apostles' Creed up there? Let's stand and affirm. Why don't you stand here with me? Stand here and affirm our faith together, okay? Uh, together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's give Joseph a hand, okay? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Thank We've certainly, seems like spring outside, so you guys all must be living right right now, you know, to affect the weather like that. And uh, also, um, um, well, Joseph, we're just really happy for your baptism. Thank you for your commitment, and we're excited about that. And uh, I want to say a word about, I told you last week that my cousin, my first cousin, Ronnie, his 12-year-old son passed away uh, last week from bone cancer. He was, uh, uh, when he was 11, they said this usually hits boys, usually between 11 and 12, and that's exactly what he was, 11 years old. And so um, he knew for quite some time his death was coming and he really faced it with uh, he had faith in Christ he he uh, had professed Christ and was baptized and knew that he was going to go be with the Lord and he faced his death with uh, confidence and uh, assurance that he knew he was going to go be with the Lord and and so at his funeral he, he was dressed he, he used to race these cars you know these little cars you know and he was dressed in his racing outfit and his scripture was I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. And, um, and he wanted at his funeral for, for Christ to be proclaimed that some of his family members, extended family, might come to know Christ as well. So that was, a, uh, uh, it's, it's not good when a 12-year-old dies, but he made uh, his witness count for Christ, and we give thanks for that. Um, Peggy Smith will also be going in for surgery this week, so why don't we go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we come singing uh, how the angels sing, angels from the realms of glory, and you invite us to come and worship, come and worship Christ, the newborn King. And Father, we do come and we adore you and praise your name, and we thank you for the joy that you give us for eternal life through uh, the death and resurrection of that infant who came in the manger. We thank you for his death, which was an atoning sacrifice for our sins and his glorious resurrection, and so that we all have the hope of eternal life through faith in him. We pray that you would uh, uh, be, with, uh, be with us, be with our country, with many things that we're facing as a nation, be with our church, and be with our local church here, that we might be a witness for you uh, always. And we pray that you'd be with uh, my cousin Ben's, uh, Ronnie's family at the loss of their son, and we pray for Peggy as she goes in for surgery this week. Be with all those on our healing prayer list. Meet each person today at the point of their need. And we, and we pray now the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
from the Old Testament as God shares about changing leaders. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave charge to Solomon, his son. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said, so be strong, show yourself a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements, as written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Amen. I'm smart at some things too, Sandy. <laughs> well, I was so smart when I, when, the, when, the, when I went to college, they saw my SAT scores and grades, and they said, you're just the kind of student we want. You're paying full price. So anyway, <laughs> well, we can, uh, as we come to the Bible, we can see ourselves in the stories of the Old Testament in the book of Kings. And its truth and insights are aimed right at our hearts. And the book of 1 Kings holds the secret uh, of success in reigning over the kingdom of our life. And it is the secret of learning to be submissive to God's authority. In other words, you can never exercise dominion over your life unless you first subject yourself or submit yourself to the dominion of God. And when you do, He gives you greater freedom and responsibility. If you reject His rulership over your life, then you cannot fulfill your desire or his desire for your life, and you can't fulfill the enormous potential that God has planned for you or for me. Instead, control of our life will gradually be given over to other forces, to other people, to uh, lusts and desires, to appetites and cravings, or to worldly values and worldly pressures. Only by submitting self-will to God's will, can we be truly free? Now, in the Hebrew Bible, the book of First and Second Kings is one book. And it's called Kings because they trace the royal dynasties of the kings of Judah and Israel. And the spotlight is always on the king. As the king goes, so goes the nation. And when the king walks with God in obedience and humility, God's blessing rests upon the kingdom. There was no such blessing for the northern kingdoms because they had no godly kings. But in Judah and in the house of David, there was victory and prosperity when godly kings had dominion. And the rains came at the right times, and the crops grew, and the economy flourished, and enemies were vanquished from the land, and there was peace in the land. When the king walked with God, there was victory and prosperity. And when the king disobeyed, there was famine, drought, war, and suffering. Good kings were always a type of Christ. And they included David, Solomon, Hezekiah, Joash, and Jehoshaphat. And in the lives of these kings, despite their human failings, we see symbols of a kingly reign that resembled the reign of Jesus Christ. And the wicked kings, were the disobedient kings, were types of Antichrist. So as the book opens, we see God has set aside a nation. He has set aside this special people, and he has made this little land that Israel occupies uh, he's made it into a, a worldwide stage for, his, for the glory of his name. And so as we open up, David is still the king. He's on his deathbed. And his son Solomon is in line to succeed him. But one of David's older sons, Adonijah, has a different idea. He's plotting a rebellion to gain control of the throne even before his father dies. And so David, learning of this, acts immediately to place Solomon on the throne, and Solomon is anointed king while David is still alive. And this symbolically suggests what the reigning authority in our lives should be. True authority must come by the gift and hand of God. 
And we cannot reign except as we are established by God. And when we give ourselves to the authority of God, then it becomes His responsibility to bring under control every circumstance, every enemy, every rebellion that would otherwise threaten our reign. And we see Solomon coming to the throne. He rules in might and power and glory. Solomon's reign marks the greatest extension of the kingdom of Israel. Israel reaches its zenith in occupied land territory, in wealth, in glory, in power under uh, Solomon's reign. And um, so he, he, he reigns with a lot of majesty and power. 1 Kings 3, 1 to 3, we see this, and we also begin to see where Solomon begins to sow the seeds of his own downfall. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, uh, and married his daughter. He brought her into the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statue of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. Now here's a man who loves God with all of his heart. Solomon begins his reign with a wonderful expression of yieldedness and a desire for God's rule and authority in his life. And he follows in the footsteps of his father David. Nevertheless, he does two little things that seem trivial that plant the seeds uh, for the, over, the eventual overthrow of his kingdom. First, he makes an alliance with the daughter of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, in Scripture, Egypt is almost always a symbolic picture of the world. So Solomon brings his daughter, uh, brings uh, this daughter of the world into the central life of the nation of Israel, and Israel, through its king, makes an alliance with the world. Now, second, Solomon worships at the high places. In the pagan religions of that day, they worshiped on the mountaintops. And the pagan tribes had erected altars, many of which was idolatrous worship and licentious worship. Frequently, there, the altar was there with a place of the fertility sex gods and was worshipped in a sexual display. These altars were overtaken by the kingdom of Israel and they made sacrifices to their god, Jehovah, on these altars. Now, though the ark of God was now in the tabernacle in Jerusalem where David had placed it, Solomon did not make his offerings at the altar in the tabernacle. Instead, he made offerings at the high places, uh, and there he sacrificed to the God he loves, but he made his sacrifices on pagan altars. And outwardly, this young king, king's rule was admirable, and his heart was honorable. Nevertheless, this one area of his life is not fully committed to, the, to God. His fellowship with, with God was weak in this sense, in that he did not understand that the secret of God's blessing lay in an inner yieldedness to God's will, represented by worship in strict obedience to his word, and practiced before the Ark of the Covenant. Solomon's lack of adherence to the Levitical rules for how he should properly worship is the first indication that something is wrong in his life. But Solomon starts out well with his kingdom. He's, he's anointed as king, and God appears to him in a dream and, and says, you can ask for whatever you want. And so Solomon does not ask for riches or gold coins or, uh, or honor. He asks for wisdom. Uh, 1 Kings 3, verse 9. Want to read that with me? Um, is that it? It's okay, go. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. Okay, so in beginning this way, Solomon indicates he understands that, that wisdom is necessary for leadership. And so then Solomon's great wisdom is tested. Two women who were prostitutes lived in the same house. They'd give birth about three days apart to their little children, and, and um, each had a boy. Well, one of the women uh, laid on her baby at night, rolled over, and the baby died. The other woman's asleep over here with her baby, and the, 
The other woman takes the dead baby and places it in this woman and takes her living baby and goes over here. So the other woman wakes up and her baby's dead. But then she looks at the baby and said, this isn't my baby. This is her baby. And so they come before King Solomon, each of them claiming the living baby. The baby's mine. The baby's mine. So in a flash, and the display of God-given wisdom and insight, Solomon says, bring the child here and put it on the table. Now give me a sword. Now we're going to cut the child in half. So each woman gets half the child. And one of the women says, yeah, that's right. Go ahead and cut it in half, and neither one of us will have the child. But the real mother said her heart was touched, and she said, let her have the baby. Let the baby live. And so um, Solomon had flushed out the imposter and spotlighted the real mother. And this was a powerful demonstration of Solomon's wisdom. And a challenge to today's judges who decide divorce cases and custody cases and adoption cases by emotionally cutting children in half rather than placing them with people who will truly love and nurture the child. Today's courts sorely lack the kind of godly wisdom displayed in Israel during the age of Solomon. Now, we are going to face times in our life when we need wisdom. What are we supposed to do? James 1.5. We bring up James 1.5. Want to read that with me? If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So let's say you come to something in your life. You don't know what to do. Ask God for wisdom, and then see how he doesn't lead us in the way we should go. Ask God. That's what James says. Now, in 1 Kings 4, 29 to 34, we find a commentary on Solomon's great wisdom. So I'm going to read this and give my, my commentary along with it. So Solomon, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the east. That includes the so-called wisdom of the Orient and from India and places like that. And greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man, including Ethan, the Ezraite, and wiser than Hermon, and Calcol, and Darda, and the sons of Mahol. And these were the media pundits of the day. Wolf Blitzer, Diane Sawyer, and the most confident man in America, Bill O'Reilly. Okay, so uh, anyway, and, uh, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 Proverbs, which we have in the book of Proverbs. And his songs numbered a thousand and five. Of those, we have the Song of Songs. And he described, he was a biology major. You didn't know that, did you? He, he described plant life from uh, the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also talked about, taught about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world. People from all over the world were coming to hear lectures by Solomon on all these things in the world. And so this is a picture of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. We have the mind of Christ. And the spiritual man makes judgments about all things. You see, Solomon didn't need a, a, a bunch of teachers to teach him about stuff. He already discerned all things. He was able to analyze and understand the workings of the world and of the human heart. And because he had the wisdom that comes from God, he was intelligent, smart, and wise. And this is where we learn that all truth is God's truth. It, it can come from the Bible or it can come from the natural world. But, but all truth is God's truth. It needs to be integrated into our lives. And he wrote some of the most famous Proverbs, which are wise sayings. And maybe you'd like to read with me Proverbs 1-7. Want to read that with me? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. How do we know if we got a good education or a complete education? If you learn the Bible and you learn about God, you get a complete education. Most of us didn't get that in schooling. We get a secular education for like certain jobs. So we need to supplement our learning. If we're going to get a good education, we need to learn what God's Word says. And we need to learn about God. Not just in our head either, but in experience. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I'm going to read this one with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, 
and he will make your paths straight. Now that's a verse we all ought to memorize because it sums up the biblical approach to life. And wisdom is not the result of mere human insight, but it's learning about God's unchanging ways. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Together, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, honoring the Lord meant giving him the portion of material goods that he required. And first fruits were the first part of the harvest and often the best. And you can really tell when people are starting to grow spiritually because you'll see it and they'll feel it in their own giving. And then Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. This is an important one. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Now, if God did not love us, he would not bother to correct us. But he does love us. Now, he also wrote uh, stuff about marriage. Uh, he wrote the Song of Songs. So I have, a, I have scripture for all the women. Uh, Song of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 2. Maybe you should say this to your husband tonight. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. How, long have you, how many of you women said that to your husbands? Huh? Come on. <laughs> and then verse, uh, verse 15. This is what the men can say to their wives. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves. <laughs> Oh my goodness, if my husband ever said that. Uh, <laughs> getting a little too mussy around here. Now, now this is uh, about the delights of married love, but it's also, some people think, it's a metaphor of Christ's love for the church. And so, but marriage is a metaphor of Christ's love and our union with Christ. So this is uh, the, the wisdom of Solomon. And Solomon made only one request from God. He asked for wisdom, and God gave it to him. I mean, in, he, was, he, he was, had wisdom, insight, and knowledge. And God, but Solomon's request contains one slight weakness. He asked for wisdom to govern his people, and that's good. But we might have asked, maybe he should have asked for wisdom to govern himself as well. And this is where, that's where he began to fail. And God granted Solomon the wisdom of governments. He also allowed circumstances in Solomon's personal life that put his wisdom to the test. Along with wisdom, God gave Solomon riches and honor. And it was riches and honor that eventually overthrew Solomon. And that's a danger for all of us. And because when, when we read about stuff that the more educated people become and the more wealthy they become, the more secular they become. They actually grow in distance from God. Maybe we should be closer to God and give more thanks to God and worship Him more and give Him thanks. But anyway, uh, Solomon gloried and exalted in the magnificence of his kingdom and pride to begin to enter his heart and pride began to produce his downfall. Now Solomon was... A well -ordered, Solomon's kingdom was a well-ordered kingdom. He delegated 11 princes and 12 governors over the land. And by dividing the governance of the kingdom in this way, Solomon ensured that the various levels of government would function in a decent and well-ordered way. And Solomon wisely knew that God is not the author of confusion, that he does all things decently and in order. Now the people prospered and were happy under the wise and firm authority of Solomon. 1 Kings 4.20 says this, And the people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, they were happy, and Solomon ruled over all the kingdom from the river, that's the, the Euphrates River, to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all of his life. And so here's a picture of Solomon's total control and godly authority over the dominion that God had given him. And this is the kind of firm control that God wants us to exercise over our own lives. God's given us a kingdom, the kingdom of our life. And, he, and so in chapter 5 to 8, we find the account of the glorious temple that Solomon built. 
For 400 years, the Israelite people had worshipped at the tabernacle, which was a tent that contained the Ark of the Covenant. But Solomon fulfilled the dream of his father David, the dream of a permanent, splendid place in which the people of Israel could worship their God. And the description of the temple in these chapters conveys a splendor almost beyond imagining. It was built from hand quarried stones, imported uh, lumber uh, from Lebanon, cedar, and then the interior was entirely covered with gold. The cost of this temple in today's uh, uh, money would not be in the millions, but the billions. And the true grandeur of the temple, however, was not the gold, but the glory. The Shekinah glory of God that came down and dwelt in the holy place when Solomon dedicated the temple. Now we see uh, Solomon dedicates the temple. The best place is, is to read it is in is, uh, 2 Chronicles. And we see, after Solomon asks for wisdom, he makes preparations for building the temple. And then he... Uh, he, start, he builds the temple, and then he furnishes the temple, and now he's getting ready to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the temple. So he has all the leaders from all over Israel coming, the priests and everything, and uh, the priests are bringing the Ark, and the trumpeters are trumpeting, and the choir's singing, and uh, they give thanks and praise to the Lord, and they're singing, He is good, His love endures forever. And then the, temp, it says that, then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. This is called the Shekinah glory. We see this throughout the Old Testament. It's the, it's a, it's the presence of God in the, in the glory cloud, is what it's called. And so they praise God. Praise be to the God of Israel, who with his hands has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to my father David. My father David had it in his heart to build a temple. God said, no, you're a man of war. Your son will build it. He'll be a man of peace. Solomon said, that's me. And so uh, then he prays a prayer of dedication. O oh Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or on earth. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You've kept your promise. And now, Lord, he said, but will God really dwell on the earth with men? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. May your eyes be open to this place and your ears attentive to our prayers and forgive and help us. Listen to this. This is, this is helpful for any, for any nation. When your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back and confess your name, praying and making supplication before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel, and bring them back to the land you gave them and their fathers. How many remember September 11, 2001? Was your church more full on that day, on that next Sunday, than it was on Easter? So it shows that mo most people, when they go to seek help from God, are still seeking help from the Christian God, right? But he wants full repentance. And then next he says, When the heavens are shut up and there's no rain because your people have sinned against you. And when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because they have, you've afflicted them. Then hear from heaven. Forgive their sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. And he said, When plagues come or when locusts come. Forgive us and help us to be right with you. And he said, when a foreigner comes, we think that, you know, the foreigners are outside. But he said, when the foreigner comes and he comes to pray in your name in this place, hear the prayer of the foreigner and, 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 and listen to his prayer. And then uh, he goes on and he makes this prayer of dedication at the temple. And he says, now rise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, the, you and the ark of your might. May your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your saints rejoice in your goodness, O Lord. Do not reject your anointed one. Remember the great promise to David, your servant. And when Solomon finished praying, it says this, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. 
The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. And when all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is good. His love endures forever. What would you do if you're standing there and he finishes his prayer and fire comes down from heaven and burns up the sacrifice? And then the glory of the Lord is in the temple. The Shekinah glory of God. And they celebrate and they worship on their face before God. But then they, they continue to celebrate. And then when everything was finished, the Lord appeared to Solomon that night. That's the second time that the Lord has appeared to Solomon. And he said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself for sacrifices. And when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. This is a very important verse. Want to read it with me? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, who's he talking to here? He's not talking to Hollywood. He's not talking to the atheists, the agnostics, and and the unbelievers. He's saying, when my people, who are called by my name, when they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So it all begins with the house of God. It begins with the people of God. And then he says to Solomon, if you continue to walk in the ways your father David did, with all your heart, you always have a king on the throne from your heritage. But if you do not, if you forsake my ways, I will uproot Israel out of this place. We need to remember God told Abraham that before, um, uh, you know, before his family and everything went to Egypt, he said, the iniquity of the Ammonites is not yet full. In other words, you can't take the land yet. Uh, so 400 years later, after they come out of Egypt, he basically says, I've had it up to here with the sin of the people of that area. They're disgusting, despicable ways. And he goes, I'm kicking them out, not because you're so good, but because they're so bad. And so the Israelites go in and they kick the people out. And now God says, if you stay true to me, you're going to stay here. But if you become like them, you're gone too. And 400 years later, after the temple was built, the Israelite people had become so wicked that God removed them. But in that foreign land, they prayed toward the temple. And 70 years later, they came back. But that's for another day. I'm getting down way, way ahead of myself here. So uh, anyway, uh, God, many, God's con- promises, many of them are conditional. You know, if you obey me, if you stay true to me with all your heart. Now, in chapter 10 of, sec- of 1 Kings, we have a visit from a, uh, a lady Uh, And she was the queen of Sheba. Ever heard of her? The queen of Sheba came to visit King Solomon. And where is Sheba? Well, we don't know exactly. It might have been Ethiopia. It might have been Yemen. But um, most likely those are the two places that she might have come from. But she she traveled a long way. Maybe to work out a trade agreement with, with Solomon. But she really wanted to see Solomon's splendor and to hear his wisdom. And she had a lot of things on her mind. And she wanted to ask him questions. So she got to ask him the hardest questions. And Solomon answered her questions with no problem. Anything was on her mind, he explained it to her. And she, and she looked at, his, at the temple and his palace and how he governed his country. And he said, it wasn't told half of me. Half to me of the splendor of your kingdom and of your wisdom. Now, um, Jesus mentions the queen of Sheba in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. And he says, uh, the queen of Sheba will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. Now, Israel was at its zenith. I mean, the most land, the most wealth. They had so much wealth, silver was almost counted as nothing because they had so much gold, you know. And so uh, that's how wealthy the kingdom was. I mean, Solomon was the smartest, wisest man who ever lived. And this, there's this poor, itinerant preacher in Israel going around saying the Queen of Sheba came from the south to listen to Solomon's wisdom 
And one greater than Solomon is here. Who does this guy think he is? God? That's an amazing statement. One greater than Solomon is here. And then John 1.11, and John 1.11, it says that Jesus, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Verse 12, you want to read that with me? Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, this queen of Sheba, she was originally pagan in belief and Gentile in race. And yet, she recognized the truth and reality of God. Unlike the religious leaders rejecting Jesus, this woman accepts the truth. She might have come to, to, to believe in God through Solomon's wisdom. And, and, and Jesus, the religious leaders are going to be re- condemned for their ignorance and defiant nature. They, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Have you received him? Do you believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Have you received him? And verse 14, John 1, 14. You want to read that with me? And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God became a man in Jesus, the incarnation. The glory of the incarnation is greater than the Shekinah glory that was in the temple. And, and by the way, when Jesus was, uh, when the wise men came looking for Jesus, they followed a star, then they went to Herod, but then this star took them right over where Jesus laid. Who ever heard of a moving star? Many people think it was the Shekinah glory of God that led him to Jesus. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. Well, then we come to, we begin to see the seeds of disobedience and decline in Solomon's reign. In 1 Kings 11, 1 to 3, it says this. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Now, polygamy was practiced, but it was not sanctioned by God. But uh, uh, there were Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 porcupines. I mean concubines. Uh, that's a joke. But anyway, uh, <laughs> and his wife, and, and they led him astray. You know. Now, in Proverbs 18.22 says this, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and receives favor from the, from the Lord. Now, apparently Solomon didn't know when he had too much of a good thing. Like 999 too many. But here we see the weakness and failure of Solomon as his heart was turned away from God. And where did Solomon's decline begin? Um, he, it began with his excessive enjoyment of the magnificence of his rule. And all this outward magnific- magnificence is evidence of God's blessing upon his life. But Solomon's downhill slide begins as his heart is captured by something else. We all need to beware uh, that riches and, and, and pleasures and everything else can capture our heart and take it away. Like Jesus said in Luke twelve thirty four. Maybe you'd like to read that with me. For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. Just like the children's sermon. If the cross goes in first, all the gold fits around it, you know. But if it's filled up with everything else, there's no room for God. Now, I recall the story of a man who enjoyed a tremendous ministry in the pulpit and in many other ways. And suddenly his ministry collapsed and was brought down in shame by charges of immorality. And it turned out that for many years there had been an unrighteous, unrepentant, unjudged affection in his heart. Outwardly, he was a minister for God. Inwardly, immorality and compromise were eating away at the substance of this man's heart. 
and life. Finally, his ministry for God was destroyed. And tragically, this story is repeated again and again in the lives of both ministers and lay people. So the first step in moral decline begins with our desires and our emotions. And what has captured first place in your mind, in your desires, in your emotions? If it's not something God has endorsed, if it is something that God has disallowed, then we begin to plant the seeds of destruction in our own life. Just as Solomon planted them his, we can see the tragic result in the next few verses in uh, 1 Kings 11, 5 to 9. Okay? He followed Ashtoreth, which was the sex goddess, the goddess of the Sidonians. And listen to this. And Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Listen to how many times God says the detestable gods. Okay? So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away. And now listen to this had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who appeared to him twice. How would you like God to appear to you twice? And he still fell away. Now, Chemosh was the hideous image to which the pagan worshipers sacrificed their children in the fire. Incredibly, Solomon himself built a place for worshiping the worship of this grinning, demonic God. And as we read through the rest of the chapter, we see that three times in rapid succession, the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon. And at the end of the chapter, it says Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And so the seeds of decline had already begun in Solomon's, uh, in the majesty of Solomon's kingdom. And even the glory of Solomon's temple proves transitory. Uh, the, the structure would stand for 400 years. But only five years after Solomon's death, it would be plundered and the gold stripped from the temple. Now, Solomon also wrote another book. It was called Ecclesiastes. Have you ever read Ecclesiastes? Let me help you out here. This was one of the most... I, when I became a new Christian, I was reading this book. I couldn't understand why it was in the Bible. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2. Look at, listen to this. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What's this book doing in the Bible? He says, pleasures are meaningless. Wisdom is meaningless. Work is meaningless. Advancement is meaningless. Riches are meaningless. Everything's meaningless. And what we have here is Solomon, after his backsliding at the end of his life, is reflecting on life. And he's basically saying everything is meaningless without God. Why? Because you're going to die, that's why. And everything you, th- everything you work for goes to somebody else. What in the world? Everything without God is meaningless. And then he comes to, to uh, chapter 12, and he says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. And, and walk with him then. And what we have today is many youth walking away from God. We, this happens at every church. A lot of, once they leave high school, they, they forget about God. At the very time they need him the most. They need God's guidance for their education, for their training, for their calling in life, for their career, for a possible marriage partner, whatever. The time they need God's guidance the most is when they start walking away from God. And then Solomon comes to the end of his life and he says this. He said, there's no end to the writing of books. How many agree with that? Uh, And and then he says in verse 13 and 14, want to read that with me? Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So knowing God's judgment to come gives us motivation to live for Him and obey His commandments now. 
He knows everything. He knows our secret thoughts and moods. He knows if they're good or evil. And so we seek to be like him here and, pro- and, and trust his promises for eternal life now and forever. Humans are religious and moral beings who find fulfillment in God's teachings that lead to a loving relationship with him. So do you want to have a loving relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth? Will you receive him? As the song says and here in a little bit, as when meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. And you could not make a more wise decision than to receive the Son of God into your hearts. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glory and majesty of Solomon's kingdom and for all of his wisdom. But we recognize that one greater than Solomon is here. And they didn't receive you. But we want to receive you. We want to receive you as our Savior and as our Lord, the leader of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. week we'll have a Christmas message and we'll take a break from the story for a couple weeks and then the week after that is a youth Sunday. So uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.